peace. <clears throat> we just pray for peace. <clears throat> peace is so important, especially as we see the continuing of the war or many of the natural disasters, earthquake, wildfires. And because of the climate change, they are now, the storms become more severe, whether it is a winter storm or whether it's a hurricane and flood. And not only that, we see poverty, we see violence, gun violence, um, confusion of identity, breakdown of the families and morals, the whole foundation of a family and society being shaken. So we, we groan for peace. We pray for peace around the world, in our community, in our family, in our heart. As the world becomes more just confused and broken, we know this peace is so vital, important, and people search for this peace. Some people think going on a vacation, somehow you can experience some peace. Or some people turn to alcohol or drugs to escape from the painful reality and to find some kind of peace. But as the call to worship declared, God says, I know the plans I have for you. It's plan to give you peace. It's plan to give you hope and a future. God wants to give us true peace. The peace that everybody's looking for. But it is so difficult to find in this broken world. This, this peace, this divine peace. That's the theme of today's message. There are three reasons why people lose the inner peace. First of all, when circumstances are uncontrollable, we lose peace. There are many things that are beyond our control in life. For important, uh, for example, you, you go for an important appointment, and on your way, there's a traffic jam, an accident ahead. Just all road is closed. You are stuck. Or your in-laws are flying in from Korea. And somehow their flight is delayed for a couple of hours. It's beyond your control. These days, many of our high school seniors, are, they're filling a college application. It's that season. But what schools will give them admission? It's beyond the student's control or parents' wish. It's like how many students apply, who are other, other applicants, and what are schools' criteria? It's beyond your control. Some young people get married, and now they want to start a family. They want to have children. And it's been a few years, and they can't get a child. There are people who work their very best in their job, and because of economic downturn, there is a hardship in business. Or the restructuring. And people are getting pink slips and termination notice. Somebody go for a health checkup. They haven't been to doctor's office for a couple of years, and, and they go for a checkup. And doctor says, I think you have a cancer. You will need detailed diagnosis. If there is a history of heart disease or diabetes or high blood pressure that runs in your family, you need to be extra careful, but you can't avoid the reality that these kind of health risk is being passed on in your own family history. It's beyond your control. There are important things in life that are beyond our control, and because of these things, sometimes our hearts are heavy. You worry. Sometimes you think it's unfair. Thoughts of just anger wells up. When things are beyond our control, it's easy for us to lose peace in our heart. Number two, we lose peace when people are unchangeable. 
especially those who are closest to us, the people whom you spend the most amount of time, when you look at them and there are certain faults, certain bad habits that they, they can't change. It seems like they don't change and, and it upsets you. How many of you have ever attempted to help somebody you love in your own family, whether your spouse, a child, your parents, you want to have them change their way. How many have tried? You know, if you change this one thing, all of us will be happier. The family will be happier. Now, is that advice or nagging? <laughs> is that a plea for help or nagging? When you repeat more than twice, it becomes a nagging. <laughs> when, when you continue to nag, the person doesn't change. Actually, the person will come. They will put up resistance. <clears throat> change is not simple. Every change involves some kind of risk or pain. They have to give up what they are comfortable with and learn some new way of doing Learn new way of being. It's not easy. It's painful. That's why if somebody wants to grow and experience a change, there is always price to pay. Even change for positive growth will involve painful price. It's true in personal growth and spiritual growth in every way. And that's why people, it's not easy to change. They, they resist change. Most people resist change. So one of the easiest ways to lose the inner peace is trying to change somebody to fit my way of thinking. You will cause conflict. You will have a clash. And there will be loss of peace in the family as well as in your own heart. Thirdly, we can easily lose peace when problems are unexplainable. All of us know that there are shiny days as well as cloudy and rainy days in life. But what causes, what brings difficulty is that when there is this painful things happen or difficult trials come our way, when we can't figure out the reason, the cause of this, this problem, people can lose peace, become upset. God, why does this happen to me? Why me? Why do you allow this, this trial, this hardship, this painful thing in my family? Why? We want to know. We want to know the reason. So we can easily lose peace when things are beyond our control or when people don't change or when we can't figure out the reason, cause of this problem. But God wants to give us peace. In Judges chapter 6, Gideon builds an altar unto the God and he calls it, the Lord is peace. That's NIV's translation, but it says, King James, Jehovah Shalom. That means the Lord is peace. Would you repeat after me? Jehovah Shalom. God of peace. That's what Shalom means, peace. God is peace. God of peace. I told you before that every name of God that is taught in Scripture, as God reveals his name, his name contains a promise. His a promise is that how God wants to meet the deepest human need. So when God reveals his name as Jehovah Shalom, God of peace, God says, I am the God who will give you the peace you need in your life and in your family. He is the God of peace that all of us need. He is the only one who can give us this true peace each of us need in our heart and in our own family. And that's why one of the most frequently used expressions of greeting in New Testament is grace and peace. Apostle Paul writes a letter to different churches and he says, grace and peace to you. 
because of Jesus Christ, the grace that is poured unto us, may you experience the peace. That's what it means. Grace and peace to you. Would you look at the person next to you and declare this truth? Grace and peace to you. Grace and peace. Because of Jesus Christ, we are given this grace. And because of Christ, we are given this peace. So God wants to give shalom, his peace, unto his, his people. And that's why in John chapter 20, on the, on the evening of resurrection, on that resurrection Sunday evening, when Jesus went to meet the disciples, they were all afraid. They gathered in this one place and locked the door. They were all fearful. And Jesus appeared to them. The first words out of risen Christ's mouth. Peace be with you. Shalom. And today's scripture reading, it says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. And the peace that I give unto you is different from what the world can offer. The peace that the world can give is temporary. It can be easily shaken and we lose it. Not only is temporary, it is a conditional the peace that the world think about is when all the situation and circumstances line up, meet your condition. That's when the world says, oh, you have peace. You are peaceful. But the peace that Jesus wants to give unto us, it's a totally different kind, different level. First of all, it's a peace that's given to us by divine grace. It is not earned because of our good deeds and we somehow accumulate merit and, and we are given this peace as a reward. That's not the kind of peace. The peace that Jesus wants to give us is peace given to us by grace of God who love us as his children and out of his rich mercy and grace, this peace comes to us. Peace that's given to us in grace number two it is, it is peace that surpasses situation and circumstances. It's a transcendent peace. It's an inner peace that's unshakable by changing situation or circumstances. When you think about peace, that all the problems are resolved and when all the situations are good and, and favorable, you will miss out the shalom that Jesus wants to give unto us. Because there is no such life as travel-free life. As long as you live, there will be unexpected setback and difficulty and hardship that will come your way. Trouble will come your way. That's why Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Jesus knew disciples and his people will experience hardship and tribulation. But Jesus says, be of good cheer. Take heart. I have overcome the world. And because I have overcome the world, even though you experience trouble, I give you this peace. Hallelujah. Even though problems are unresolved around us, Jesus wants to give us this peace because of him who has overcome the world. How do we experience this transcendent peace, lasting peace, unshakable peace? There are three steps to experiencing this shalom, God's peace. Number one, acceptance. Number two, trust. Number three, surrender. Let me unpack that. First of all, accepting what cannot be changed. There are some things that we can't change by our own effort or our own ability. It's something that is just given unto us that we have to accept. You know, when people encounter a very difficult problem and hardship, how do people respond? Many respond in worry. But worry can't change a thing. Worry doesn't resolve the problem. Sometimes people become resentful. Whomever caused the problem, just because you blame somebody doesn't change the problem. Or what if you cause the problem and you feel a sense of shame or guilt? It 
doesn't change the situation. It doesn't bring peace to you. The only way that we can experience peace when all these troubles come our way is that if there are some things that we can't change, we just have to accept it. Accepting the present reality that we cannot change. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, there is this story. You know how David took somebody else's wife, Bathsheba, that belonged to one of his generals, Uriah. Not only he had adultery, took somebody's wife, but he ended up killing the husband. You know, he kind of arranged a battle, KIA situation. Get him killed. Murder. After that, Bathsheba becomes pregnant. And God sends a judgment through a prophet. Prophet comes to announce this child will die. But what does David do? For seven days, he went on fasting and prayer. God, I am the one who sinned. Please let this child live. But in seven days, the child dies. And all the court officials, they are afraid. You know, when the child was lying, dying, he was so troubled. He didn't eat anything. He fasted. Now, how do we tell him? the news that the child has died. He will be so heartbroken. Something bad will happen. But David kind of knew by the mood. So he asked him, is the child dead? Yes, sir, my Lord. He gets up, washes himself, takes a shower, bring the food. Then he begins to work the affairs of the nation. And the court officials are perplexed and they ask, how can this be? David's answer, well, I will be able to go to the child, but the child cannot return to me. While child was still alive, even though he was sick, I will humble myself and ask for mercy. But once the child is dead, nobody can turn back the clock. In the future, I will die, and I will go to the child. But this dead child will not return back to me, so I'll just ask, I have to accept God's will at this situation. Accepting what you cannot change. So there are some things that we cannot change by human ability, and we have to accept it. For Apostle Paul, messenger of the gospel. He faithfully preached the gospel all around the Roman world. Then he was arrested. He was taken as a prisoner to Roman prison. And now, he was waiting for his execution, martyrdom. But while he was imprisoned in Rome, he writes letters to different churches. We call them prison epistles. Letters written from the prison. And one of the prison epistles is called Philippians. It is one of the most positive books in the Bible. And it, he says, rejoice. I tell you once again, rejoice. Here is a prisoner who is in prison. He didn't do anything wrong. He was just preaching the gospel. He was doing all the good deeds. But he was falsely accused of causing trouble. And he's in prison, and he's going to die in a few months. But he's writing this letter. He says, rejoice. How can he be such a positive attitude? Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 and following. He's telling people in Philippi, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. He says, I have learned to be content. Whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what, is, uh, what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who strengthens me. Did you hear that? I can do everything through whom he strengthens me. He's in present. He will not be released. 
He is waiting for his martyrdom. But he says, I can do everything through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. And he says, I had learned to be content in every circumstances. So from what Apostle Paul is declaring, this is something that we have to learn. Acceptance. Acceptance is a learned attitude. Because Apostle Paul says, I have learned to be content. Oh, that's what it means to be living in faith. That's what it means to walk in wisdom. It doesn't come naturally. We have to learn to walk in this faith. Oh, God is in charge. God is in control. If God gives me a season of living in need and being hungry, I will learn. If God gives me a season of being in plenty and well-fed, I'll be grateful. No matter what situation and circumstances, I will learn to accept what I cannot change. And I will, I'll be content with what God allows me to have. We need grace of God, but we also need to resolve in faith, I will accept what I can't change. I will accept what God is giving me now. You know, one of the reasons why people lose heart, you know, the inner peace is not knowing the reason or the cause. But when we want to know the reason, demanding an explanation is one of the ways that we can easily lose this heart that blocks experiencing the shalom. When I demand, I want to know the reason. That's like having an argument with God. Why God? Why do you allow this hardship and difficult happen to me or my family? When you demand, when you insist, you want to know, that will block the way of experiencing God's peace. You know, some people, because of this difficult problem, you want to know the reason and the cause, and you play, replay in your mind the video clip, why is this happening to me? As long as you are replaying the videotape in your mind, you will not be able to experience peace. The storm will not become calm. God, why is this happening to me or my family? When you ask God to give you the reason, let me tell you this, God doesn't owe you explanation for everything. After all, he is the sovereign God and we are only creatures. What makes us to think that God owes explanation for everything? It's actually a pride, human pride that demand to know the reason and the cause. God is sovereign. His wisdom is beyond our even imagination. He is perfect in wisdom and power. We just have to trust him. That God is a good God. God is loving God. That God is faithful. No matter what happens, no matter what the problem that comes our way, we just have to surrender and submit to his sovereign rule. Would you repeat after me? God is good. God is faithful. God is loving. No matter what happens to me and my family, this doesn't change that God is good, that God is faithful, God is loving. I just have to trust that the sovereign God is good and faithful and loving even though I cannot understand. So humbly, we have to declare before God, God, even though I don't understand, I submit to you, your sovereign rule, your sovereign plan, that you are good, that you are faithful, that you are loving. I will trust in you. Number two, even if God did explain things, why things happened the way it did, we wouldn't be able to understand it all. You know, there are some things that only adults can experience that child cannot understand. There are some things that only parents and grandparents know and experience. 
that young people cannot understand. Until they get married, until they have kids of their own, <laughs> there are some things that young people will never understand about how parents feel or grandparents feel. And there are, that's why there are some things that only preachers who are seasoned and older will understand the things of the scripture. Because there are some things that through your life experience and walking with God, you get to understand. Young people and children don't understand certain things. Now, we are speaking about human experience in, in life, in experience, but think about how God, who is infinite in wisdom and love, even if he explains some things to us. We will not be able to understand the depth and height of his wisdom. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Oh, God's ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So even if he would explain why these things are allowed to happen to us, we wouldn't understand. Years later, when we come back, we'll say, oh, that was God's perfect timing. I am glad God didn't allow me to have it at the time. I am glad God didn't answer my prayer at the time. And God says, wait, now I know it was God's perfect timing. You know, there are forces at work in my life, in my family, in my children's life, in our church, in this world. There are some things and forces at work that we don't understand. There are evil and wicked forces at work, but there are also forces at work from our loving and faithful God. Hallelujah. And praise the Lord, he who is within us is greater than he who is in the world. Hallelujah. So God sends his Holy Spirit to re live within us and the Spirit of Christ who causes us to envision and dream and hope and work for his kingdom. He is greater than the one who is in the world. Hallelujah. The forces of hope and love and grace is bigger than forces of hatred and violence and death. Hallelujah. People lose peace. They demand to know the reason. But explanation never brings the peace of mind anyway. You know, if I can only know why this happened, I will have peace. Really? Really? Just because you find out the reason and the cause of this problem doesn't bring peace to your heart. If you find out that it was somebody else's problem, somebody else's you know, fault, you will blame the person. You will resent the person. You will hate the person. What if you find out that you are the one to blame, that your own foolishness, your own mistake is causing this problem and pain for your family and for your organization? Can you bear the burden and the guilt and the shame? No. Just because you find out the reason doesn't give you peace. We experience peace by God's presence. Hallelujah. God who is loving and merciful, whose concern, whose interest, whose loving care for us doesn't change. The calling and gift of God is irrevocable. Hallelujah. I call you as my child. My calling and my gift unto you is irrevocable. I don't cancel my call unto you. You belong to my family. When we realize this, God's unchanging love and call and claim upon our life, and he is with me, his presence, his faithfulness, that's what brings peace. Hallelujah. So when God is silent, doesn't tell us the reason and the cause, we just have to accept what can't be changed. There are sometimes God will tell us the reason and why, when we need to repent or change. When we have to 
ask for forgiveness and make peace and restitution and make things right, he will tell us, this is where you went wrong. Repent. Ask for forgiveness. Make peace. You forgive. You let go. When God shows us why, he's calling for steps of obedience. That's the only time he will speak to us. But when God is silent, when God doesn't reveal to us the reason and the cause, we just have to accept his way. Hallelujah. Accept what can't change. Number two, trust. Trust in his loving care. Isaiah 26 says, Thou will keep them in perfect peace, those whose mind is stayed on thee. Those who trust in God, God will keep in perfect peace. Hallelujah. When we trust him, when our mind is fixed upon him, he will keep our heart in perfect peace. Shalom. That's why Proverbs chapter 3 says it this way. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not upon your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. In all your ways, in all you do, acknowledge him. Acknowledge him as the sovereign creator and savior and good loving shepherd and loving father who wants to lead us and guide us and provide for us and protect us. In his perfect wisdom and love, he wants to take care of us. Trust him. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Then he will make your path straight so that you will not go round and round in circle and wasting your time and your life and your energy somewhere else. No, he will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not upon your short-sighted. Your experience and your knowledge Oh, yes, all of that's valuable. It can be used to build up the kingdom of God. But do not lean upon your understanding. Trust him. Trust him and his word. You know, there is no travel-free life. Whatever problem that you have in life, problems, you may have a list of different problems. And by the grace of God, when they are resolved, there'll be more troubles that will come. Life is continuation of troubles and difficulty and obstacles. But praise the Lord, God is faithful. God's loving care for us will lead us. And Jesus says, in this world, you will have tri tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I will give you peace. I will keep you in perfect peace. Trust in me. Hallelujah. So number three, number three, surrender to God's control. Surrender to God's loving lordship and control. That's the difference between false religion, superstition, and true faith. False religion, superstition, shamanism. People want to make their own will, their own wish, the central focus. And they want God to be the sidekick who will help, who will just bless and help you to accomplish your goal, your plan, and your agenda. You are the Lord. You are the master. And you are calling God to be your assistant. That's like before Galileo, people thought, the earth is the center of the universe and sun and the moon and the stars all going around. It's a geocentric view. But there was this transformation of perspective. Copernicus, you know, he declared, earth is not the center. The sun is the center. Earth revolves around the sun. That's the heliocentric view. 
And that's the analogy of life. God is the center. We need to order our lives around God's will and God's word and God's principle. God is the one who's calling the shot. False religion. Even in the name of Christianity, when your own will, your own agenda, when you become the center, and when you ask God to line up around your own insistence and your own foolish agenda, that's not true faith. That's false religion. That's superstition. So from here on, we say, God, you are the center. You are the Lord. I want to follow your will. I want to obey and submit to your word. Romans 8, 6 says, The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. When our mind follows the sin-corrupted mind that brings death, death of true faith, death of gratitude, death of joy, death of peace, but when we submit our mind to Holy Spirit's leading and guidance and to the word of God, it brings life and peace. Hallelujah. So every morning, we need to decide who will rule and govern my life today. Is it me or is it Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior? No matter what happens to me, Will I trust that God is good and faithful and loving? Will I submit to his will? Will I follow his word? Those who love the word of God and submit to him. Psalm 119, verse 165 says it this way. Great peace have they, those who love your word. And nothing can make them stumble. Hallelujah. Hallelujah great peace you will have when you trust and love the word of God. God will, God will protect you from stumbling. Let me wrap up today's message. God wants to give the very best life. He says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Another translation says, plans for peace and not for disaster. Plan to give you hope and a future. Mm. How do we experience this shalom, peace? Jesus says, in this world, you will have tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. So accept what we can't change and trust in his loving control and surrender. God, I surrender to you. You are the Lord. You call the shots for my life. You are the master. I submit to you. So join me in your prayer. In your own word, would you tell God, God, I'm sorry for so long. I wanted to know the reason. I demanded explanation before obedience. I wanted to know I want it understanding before I submit to your plan. But God, from here on, even when I don't understand, I'll submit to you. I will accept what I can't change. When God is silent, I will submit, accept, trust in his loving care, surrender to God's loving lordship.